The IDF released images of their first airstrikes on Gaza since last month's ceasefire, which ended 11 days of deadly violence. Notably though, for the first time in a dozen years, these airstrikes were ordered with an Israeli Prime Minister not called Netanyahu. That's right, for anyone who was hoping that the uh Removal of Benjamin Netanyahu as Prime Minister of Israel would lead to some peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. Unfortunately, you were misled into thinking that because we are now hearing about an increase in violence, certainly in response to what the Israeli military is referring to as incendiary balloons. Now, that sounds comical, but I'll give you all the details you can judge for yourselves. So the helium filled balloons, which were affixed with incendiary devices, were floated into Israel on Wednesday, both before and after the airstrikes. The IDF, the Israeli military, of course, says the balloons were launched as a protest to the provocative flag march in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, where thousands of Israelis marched through the old city. In fact, I want to go to this video featuring Hadas Gold from CNN. She reports on the ground in Israel and she helps to elaborate on what caused this flare up in violence again in East Jerusalem. Take a look. That yesterday, it wasn't just the balloons that were launched, there was the flag march that took place in Jerusalem. This is an annual march, it's usually attended by right wing Jewish groups, and it takes place to celebrate when Israel took control of the Western Wall and East Jerusalem in the 1967 war. This march was supposed to take place last month on Jerusalem Day. It was canceled at the last minute when Hamas began firing rockets towards Jerusalem, of course, that helping to trigger that 11 day blood conflict. So this march was rescheduled under Netanyahu's government and Naftali Bennett, his new government, one of their first moves was to actually just allow the march to take place as scheduled. There was a huge police presence because part of the march was expected to take place in front of Damascus Gate. This is the main entrance for Muslim worshippers into the old city. It's the one it leads directly into the Muslim quarter of the old city. So it already was a provocative move to have these uh, right wing Jewish groups uh, marching, dancing with the Israeli flag in this closet in front of the gate. Now, the police did not allow them to enter the old city through the gate. They instead marched along the outside and entered through the Jaffa gate. But they were, I was there, they were heard uh, chanting slogans such as Jerusalem is ours, Jerusalem is our home. At one point, some of them were even chanting death to Arabs. So that gives you uh, some more details about some of the uh, provocative moves by the ultra conservative um, or ultra nationalist, uh, you know, Israeli groups group uh, marching through this neighborhood. Uh, Hamas uh, preemptively with these incendiary balloons uh, decided to retaliate. Um, and of course, they did the same with the balloons after the fact. But I mean, look, I'm not justifying what Hamas did with the balloons. Obviously, that was wrong. But um, I, I also don't want to make uh, the mistake that sometimes happens in the media where mm -hmm. people draw these false equivalencies clearly Balloons with incendiary devices are very different from full blown airstrikes. But How? It, it, I don't understand I any mean, distinction I, between these. <laughs> it shouldn't even have to be said, right? But yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there are some, you know, dishonest actors who try to pretend like they can't tell the difference. But clearly, there's a difference. Here's the good thing, though. Uh, luckily, no one died from the airstrikes. No one died from the balloons. Um, but there was one death uh, unrelated to the airstrikes and balloons, which I'll get to in just a minute. But mm -hmm. John, jump in. Yes, look, I'm being sarcastic because I'm angry about the way that the media talks about this. I've talked for a long time about how annoyed I get every single time I see when there's a flare-up in violence. You can, you already know what the headlines and subheadlines are going to be. Uh, X rockets were fired, and then Y Palestinians were killed. So you like you can count the dead when Israel attacks Palestine. They don't. There's nothing equivalent when the Palestinians attack Israel. So that's why they just say how many shots they fired. Okay, you never say how many missiles were fired from Israel because you don't need to. You can just count the dead because they're that effective. And so that's why it's not to say that these these balloons aren't dangerous. They do set fire to buildings. In in it is entirely conceivable that someone could die mm -hmm. as a result of them. But it is still a balloon that's being used. And if you think that they're the same, okay, swap. 
If it's the same, then you take the balloons and you give them the missiles. No, obviously is it very, very different. And, I, and briefly, I just want to mention one additional thing. Um, Haras Gold there, I think most of what she said was perfectly fine, said the march was initially delayed because Hamas fired rockets yeah, at Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not why it was delayed at all. You're I'm correct. not saying that, that that wasn't a part of the story eventually, but Palestinians were brutalized. Al Aqsa Mosque uh, was basically invaded by security forces. I, I just yeah, love, you're like, right. it's yes. just like Jake Tapper before. It's this. Can we wait a year before we rewrite history totally to make the Palestinians the you know the 100% villains? You're really gonna jump on that right now? Yeah, I'm glad you caught that because I wanted to comment on that as well. And it wasn't just the raiding of Al Aqsa Mosque; it was also um, as a result of uh, Palestinians being forced out of their homes and evicted in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, there was also the fact that uh, during the month of Ramadan, the religious activity of Palestinians in Jerusalem were significantly restricted. So all of those provocations and all of those restrictions led to the horrible, horrible situation that we saw, the violence and aggression toward Palestinians over those 11 days that were referenced in that video. Now I do wanna talk a little more about that flag march because I was hoping that they would just kind of let the flag march go, um, you know, after canceling it uh, earlier. But no, they didn't, uh, and they decided to do the march. And so, as uh, was reported during the flag march, Israeli police in riot gear. Blocks surrounding streets, forcibly removing Palestinian protesters from the route. 33 Palestinian protesters were injured, including by stun grenade, rubber bullets, and live fire, with six evacuated to hospital following clashes with Israeli security forces around East Jerusalem, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society said. Also, Hamas the and other militant groups in Gaza did not immediately respond to with rocket fire into Israel. And I think that's important. They did retaliate after the missile strikes, but they did so with the incendiary balloons, right? Mm -hmm. But the situation along the Israel Gaza border remains extremely tense, and the possibility of an imminent and serious escalation cannot be ruled out. That's and listen, sure. I mean, when you think about the conditions that Palestinians are currently facing in Gaza, in this open air prison, you know, we have these discussions about Israel having the right to defend itself. But imagine if you're in this in these conditions, if you're held in these conditions where it's difficult to get humanitarian aid, where your future is uncertain, where you have no freedom, where you know you really have no real autonomy mm -hmm. because everything you do is dictated by the Israeli government, right? And so it's important to talk about the asymmetrical nature of all of this, both politically and and also. When it comes to military capability and defense capability, clearly Israel has far more than the Palestinians do in terms of being able to protect themselves. And I think that that does oftentimes get left out of the conversation with the exception of the 11 days of violence that we had covered about a month ago. That was when the tide kind of started to turn in the media mm -hmm. and the way that they were covering it. Now. There was one Palestinian woman who was shot and killed as a result of some of these protests in response to the flag march. Let's take a look at that. Earlier in the day, at least 17 Palestinians were arrested as they protested the ultra-nationalist Israeli March of the Flags taking place in occupied East Jerusalem. Some participants in that march chanted death to Arabs and may your village burn down. This is Palestinian legal activist and protester Farid al -Atrash. They should stop all the acts by the Israeli occupation and the settlers by entering Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the capital of the Palestinian state. We're telling Jerusalem and the Jerusalem residents that you're not alone, and there should be an end to all this aggression by the Israeli occupation in front of the whole world. So uh, that video, of course, detailed a little more about the flag march and, and you know the aftermath of that. Uh, but the video that I was referring to um, is this one, which gives you some more details about the Palestinian woman who was shot and killed. Forces shot dead a Palestinian woman in a town northeast of Jerusalem earlier today. She was identified as 29-year-old Meafana, a doctoral student. The Israeli military claimed she attempted to ram her car into a group of soldiers. Local media report no ambulance was sent to care for her after she was shot. 
The killing came the day after Israel launched overnight air raids on Gaza for the first time since a ceasefire with Hamas was declared in May, following a brutal 11 day bombardment of the Gaza Strip. Yeah. And look, I. That's, I it's, mean. I mean, yeah, I mean, running your car into a crowd of people is obviously wrong. Um, and it's gonna be met with uh, brutal force. And that's exactly what happened. Um, as far as we know from assuming the Assuming that's what happened. Assuming, yes, that's exactly. What and, and that's an important thing. Look, that's how it's being reported. We're not on the ground. We don't know for sure. So obviously, that's an important caveat. Um, but all of this violence, all of it doesn't need to happen. That's the problem. The, there's absolutely no desire on the Israeli side to genuinely engage in negotiations over you know creating a two really following through on a two state solution mm -hmm. there's never going to be a one state solution i mean i think it's this situation is too far gone and it's it's too I just think it's impossible at this point, right? I mean, even the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel are treated as secondhand, second class citizens. Mm -hmm. It's wrong, it's well, wrong. But Bennett explicitly doesn't want one. Exactly. And and Biden, maybe if you pressed him, might say he's in favor of it. But I don't know, that's like most of his priorities. It's like you have to dig to try to, to, try to get to them. And, that, and that's the thing too, like, I mean, the, the timing of this, okay, you know, with the march and all that, maybe that's what it's all about, or maybe, you know, the new government would have found some way to come out the gate swinging, saying, okay, no, Nanyahu has gone, but this is still the situation. This right. is the status quo. Um, I don't know, it reminds me of, you know, when Trump, Trump went in office, um, really quickly after he was inaugurated, we had that disastrous mission, I believe it was into Yemen. Um, we had the deployment of the, the Moabs in Afghanistan. Like people, people want to show, no, I'm just as bloodthirsty as the guy that that came before me. And so that's my fear. Now, we had heard in the wake of Bennett forming that coalition government that uh, you know Biden saying this is going to be an opportunity for a new relationship. No, know, it looks pretty much like the old one, honestly. It is. It is. And what I, I understand Biden's doing stuff abroad or whatever. You you could ask him about this. Does I mean, he care? Does he have thoughts? But that's the thing. I I think that. First off, the Israeli government really has, in their minds, no incentive to push for a solution. And the Biden administration, and not just the Biden administration, the US government overall hasn't provided an incentive. They haven't provided carrots or sticks, right? In fact, they get carrots no matter what. The Israeli government gets help from the United States in the form of weapon sales, um, military funding, uh, foreign aid on a yearly basis, all of that help. And it's pretty much unconditional. Uh, there, there is no, there's nothing attached to that indicating that the United States is either demanding, even suggesting that the Israeli government uh, in a sincere and genuine way engage in negotiations for a two state solution. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So this this violence is gonna continue. And the reason why what we're seeing today really seems as though it's gonna be no different from what we experienced during the, you know, during Netanyahu and his leadership is because Bennett, Naftali Bennett, the new prime minister is actually in some ways, maybe even more extreme than Netanyahu was. In the past, Bennett, has pushed former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to take a tougher stance against Hamas and the launching of incendiary balloons. Okay, so he doesn't think that Netanyahu went far enough. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, he certainly does not believe in a one state solution, not even close. And he was critical of Netanyahu from the right of him. Now this new government is a coalition government. Yes, it has some Arab representation for the first time in the history of the Israeli government. But that is a very fragile coalition that's been bound by one thing and one thing only, ousting Netanyahu. Now that Netanyahu has been ousted, anyone who thinks that you know there's gonna be a more moderate approach to this conflict, I think is mistaken. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.